and we're live. Hey, how's everybody going out there? This is Kareem. We're getting ready to go live. I got my guy, Mark Bassett. He is in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, somehow he seems to be traveling and in, the, in exotic locations all over the place. Uh, I'm the host of the show, but he takes all the trip. I guess that's because he's a uh, retired he's, Kareem. He's, he's a retired old man. guy, and uh, he's uh, he gets to travel the world. That's what, what happens. But, uh, Mark, I, I'm very envious of you, but uh, I'm glad to have you with us on today. Those of you who are out there watching us in the social media stream, uh, we're going to continue our conversation that we had on last week. We're going to keep going on that concept of critical race theory and talking about how uh, the issues of race have now found themselves or are embedded in our systems is what that concept talks about. We'll give you more definition of that um, as we get going. I want to give a shout out to my mother. She is the first one in here. Love that head wrap in your uh, your icon badge on your Facebook stream. There it is, Mark. I do too. I like color. That, that's a great head <laughs> Yeah, so we're going to get going started. We're going to get started. Let's like tag and share this conversation as we get in here. We're getting ready to get going. Great seeing you as well, uh, Rebecca Garth Townsend. We're going to keep this conversation going as we get into the show. Turning everyone down. Welcome to United Shades of Grey, Conversations of Race in America on WSGW. Now, here is your host, Kareem Bowen. Hey, this is Kareem Bowen. Welcome to another United Shades of Grey conversation. We are here today. I am enjoying what the weather has been presenting over the past couple of days. We're in Michigan. It has been cold normally, but hey, these past couple of days, we're starting to see the springtime peek its head through the clouds. Chandler, what did you think about the sunshine that we're experiencing in the moment? It's been so long, but I looked outside and the sun was shining through my window. It was warm. I, I can't believe it. <laughs> Chandler, your excitement and your anticipation, you're like a one-man show on Broadway. Uh, Mark, Mark, great to have you. We're, we're here, and as you know, as usual, we have Mark Bassett, who has been uh, sitting in. He is my co-host. He's out there in albuquerque new mexico hopefully we get some live shots in terms of what's happening in albuquerque uh, uh mark what's going on with you buddy just enjoying my uh my oldest son and his uh wife and two grandkids having a good time here in albuquerque all right so it's good to have you i'm glad you were able to link in the, the thing that is so amazing about modern technology you you know things that you had to be what did we do before you know all of this technology now we get to get on, you know, planes and travel the world and we can still link in and be in the same space all at the same time. So, Mark, you've left, but you're still here. I'm still here. All right. I remember the days in my early career where I would pull over on the side of the road, use a pay phone with a calling card to call in for work. I mean, you know, <laughs> Isn't that funny? It is crazy. Can you even find a pay phone? I want you to mark, mark why you're out there in Albuquerque, because I know I, I can't find any here in Michigan. While you're driving down in the desert somewhere, see if you can find a paper on the side right. of you. I'll look. All right. So what's going on? We got Chandler P in the place to be, the uh, the producer of the of the year. Uh so is it's not Travis. It's not Travis today. He's he's Chandler Travis, yes. Okay. <laughs> Sounds like a great country singer. What's going on, Travis? I'm doing pretty good over here. I love uh running the show and today it's been a little bit crazy, but uh I think things have smoothed out. OK, well, we have a phone number for so for some of you that want to be a part of the conversation. You certainly uh, can tune in by uh, calling in the number uh, 989-776-6517. We want you to get your question uh, or your comment in. We'll take the call and put you in and you'll be able to share with us. Uh, we're recording live here on Wednesday. This show will then play on Sunday at 7 p.m. on 100 point. Uh, five and seven ninety a.m. simulcast. Um, but we, we we talked about we started talking about critical race theory on last weekend. So I want to get back there. Um, but you know how we do. We want to talk about things that are hot off the press first. Um, and we're gonna do that today. Um, Mark, you shot me a couple emails. Um, over about a couple of things that we want. We'll we'll bring them into this conversation, uh, especially as we begin to talk today. But I want to talk about what everyone is talking about right now, which is Putin's war in Ukraine. I keep looking at it like each week I go back and look, I'm like, we're talking about the war in Ukraine. Who would have thought that three weeks after this initial evasion that this would still be going on? I, I would have never thought that. 
Um, but we're looking at this and uh, it appears we, we kind of now know what, what what's going on. Uh, this is not just a portion of Ukraine that he's trying to do. He's not trying to, you know, free soldiers or whatever that situation is. But this is an all out assault on uh, Ukraine. And it looks like he wants the whole of Ukraine, seeing that he's invaded in every single part. Uh, Mark, what are the gas prices uh, looking like out there? <laughs> I, I, I haven't had to get gas yet, but I'm guessing they're pushing five bucks. Um, so yeah, yeah, out west, I would imagine they're they're probably a bit higher than 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 in other places, especially when you're hitting that western seaboard, yep. southwest California. Yeah, those prices tend to be about. I was in Palm Springs, whatever, three weeks ago, two three weeks ago, it was already five dollars. Then really, already five. Uh, yeah, in California. Yeah. Well, so so there's supposed to be some relief on the way. Yep. We know that today we saw our first incremental increase in terms of our, our rates. Um, so it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Now, this is what I want to talk about. OK, so we, we've been talking about these uh, these, you know, sanctions on the oligarchs. And for those of you who are listening, oligarchs are very rich people who have great influence in in government that's what an oligarch is so um they've been sanctioning both the oligarchs and putin and russia and th i think they said that the value of their money uh, is now equivalent to less than a penny I, I mean i can't even begin this is like worse than jamaica's economy you know what i mean this is mexico you know three thirty three hundred thousand pesos you know what i mean so it, it's kind of crazy to see what's going on. But my thing that I've been worrying, uh, concerned about it and, and just kind of thinking is that today we, I guess, assigned, if I'm not mistaken, another eight hundred billion dollars or eight hundred million dollars toward this fight. Um, Mark, where is this money coming from? I mean, it's like we're since 2000. That's, that's some change in the U.S. government, Karim. Since, since, since 2020, I promise you, we, we were we had no money for this, no money for programs, no money for healthcare, no money for this. When 2020 came about, we were giving away checks and credit cards and debit cards and bridge cards and just throwing money all over the place. Um, and now we're dealing with, I think, the inflation of creating money and throwing money out the window and giving money to everybody. Where is all this money coming from now? You know, a billion dollars to the war in Ukraine um, during a time when we have great inflation. Uh, how how do we do this? Where is this money coming from? Well, apparently the taxpayer pays for it or they print more money or again, and I'm not a Ph.D. economist, but ultimately the U.S. citizen pays. I mean, that's the eternal conundrum. You know, it's like, how does everyone everyone has a want? Everyone has a need. Everyone thinks the government should be paying for it. But the reality is, is the U.S. citizen pays for it. So, so that's what I'm saying. So when we yeah. look at this and, and we're looking at everything that has happened really over the past, this is 2022 since uh, March of 2020. Uh, there's been a lot of, you know, you, you just said something that was funny, Mark. You said, you know, we print more money. But, you know, that money has to be tied to something. It's not like this cryptocurrency that, you know, the binary code that it's just mm -hmm. how it represents something. This money has to be tied to something, and I guess that's why we're experiencing inflation. But does how do these dollars that we're spending overseas during this war, uh, and we're trying to combat inflation, we're, we're past the you know let's you know recover from the pandemic mode, and now we're into fight inflation mode. But you know every billion dollars that we send to another country, does that impact us? Our is that also going to increase our inflation? So we're fighting against ourselves. So in in essence. As we fight the world's battles, uh, we are also increasing inflationary risk in our in our nation. What's going on here? I don't know. I don't know, but I'm I'm just curious where all this money comes from when we print it like this. And you guys are like, yeah, so are we. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, ultimately, I, that's the that's what we pay our government to do, though. Is there's, Isn't a, there's a lot of issues out there. I mean, ultimately, as you said last week, you can't let Russia just do whatever they want to do and take over i mean um there's a cost to that as well long term and so you it's a constant act of any leader frankly i mean that's what leadership's about is trying to balance uh all the different issues out there and you only have so many resources and trying to figure out what the best place to put your resources are against and there's really no answer that everyone's going to be happy with ultimately i mean that's the that's the mantle of leadership so 
Well, I was told that emer leaders emerge in crisis, so this is the yep. time to emerge. What are you going to say, Chandler? I was going to ask, uh, isn't the dollar not based on anything anymore? Like, didn't we give it's, up the gold standard? It's, it's dollar, even... it's dollar, dollar uh, cryptocurrency now. It's all. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. I, you know, that would be interesting because before we knew that the dollar and the gold had a consistent ratio and they were connected to one another. We, uh, you know, someone needs to get educated in this conversation. We can't all be financial dummies about what's going on in the government. Uh, so let's, we'll talk about that. Maybe we should talk about things that we can talk I'll, about. I'll order finances for dummies. All right. But, yeah, and we'll, we'll figure it out. But uh, so, so there's nearly now this is I want to transition. We're still talking about this issue in Ukraine. But, uh, you know, this is United Shades of Grey conversations on race in America. And, you know, it's funny because I get asked uh, by people all the time, why do you always want to talk about race? I love talking about race. Um, I like having these conversations. Um, you know, it was interesting when I was uh, in high school. I went to high school here in Carlton, which is we're technically are we technically in Carlton here? I think so. Yeah, I think the radio station technically falls in Carlton. So yeah. I'm like in the backyard of where I went to high school. And, um, you know, growing up, it was. Uh, not a very diverse community. And then I left and went to Michigan State, which was like diversity overload. Um, and 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 having that experience in the first, uh, my first semester on campus, I had to take an elective and there was a class called the Black Experience, the Black Experience. Uh, and I took that class and I was stuck. I was, I was in love. Um, it talked about, uh, you know, just African civilizations and everything that was going on in the world. And you know, the people of Kimi and the Cushitic, uh dynasties. And it talked about the Shaka Zulu and, and the warriors. Uh, but it, re I remember reading one book with the title of the book. And, and Mark, if you ever get a chance to read this, Ty Chandler Tyler, this is your homework for uh, the upcoming week. There's a book by the name of Sundiata. Um, it was an amazing book. You got to read it. Uh, when I began to understand, what's that? Oh, I was like, I was like, I will look that up right now. Where's my phone? It's the clock. Yeah, your phone is the clock. Uh, but the name of the book was Sundiata, and it was an amazing book about, you know, just um, the hierarchy and the uh, kingship that existed in, in Africa. And it just really blew my mind because I had never heard African. You know, I always thought Sully, Sally Struthers, that was her name. I could never remember this woman's name. Sally Struthers. All would the family. These, you know, yep. these uh, feed a hungry child commercials and all of this stuff going on. So I, you know, thought Africa was full of folks that were running around, you know, half naked loincloths and big bellies, you know, cause they were hungry. Um, but when I began to take that class, the African, uh, the black experience, and then I took the African experience. Um, and I started taking those classes in sociology. It really awakened my eyes and challenged me to really begin to think. And my family thought I was becoming, uh, this militant black man, but really I was becoming a man, uh, who was empowered by uh, his knowledge of history and the wonderful things that existed there. But um, as I look at this, and, and I'm going to point number two, what's hot off the press, uh, we're looking at nearly, you know, over 3 million people, Ukrainians have, uh, are now refugees. This is absolutely, this is mind boggling. Um, you know, we've seen, you know, these types of things happen before. Uh, and, and might I add, just right next door, Japan is now under tsunami watch. Mm. Uh, you know, they had a 7.2 uh, earthquake today that hit their capital city. And so they're they're under a tsunami watch. I mean, could you imagine the atrocities that we could be experiencing all at the same time? Should that take place? Well, that's just nature. That one's just like literally just nature uh, working against us, which it often does. Absolutely. But I'm just thinking like this is this is a lot going on when it rains, it pours. <laughs> Absolutely. But I was thinking this make this got me thinking when I was looking at this three million Ukrainians that are now refugees. And I asked myself, is the world treating them different than other refugees um, of other countries that have been under similar conditions? Uh, and I think that this is I think this is a great point to kind of talk about. Um, and I asked the question, is race a factor? We know that there have been some issues with. Um, they're exiting of, you know, Ukraine into countries like Poland and them not wanting to help some of the, as they said, the black individuals that were trying to get out of there that weren't Ukrainian um, and saying, you know, hey, we're not helping blacks and that story. And so some of the ambassadors from other countries have gotten involved. And I think that that issue, I think they put them all on one bus and like got them out of the country. Um, and so um, I began to look at that. And I said, you know, I thought about if you remembered when. Uh, Haiti had the earthquake again. The first earthquake Haiti had 
um, I was working still in, in sports and we put a tent city together uh, in one of the soccer stadiums and we sent people down and created gardens and all of this stuff. It was a cool opportunity. But this particular hurricane that took place in Port-au-Prince, same thing all over again. It's absolutely crazy. Um, displaced so many individuals and many of those individuals by way of South America found them way, themselves coming, trying to come into the United States. And if you remember, there was that whole city, tent city of 10,000 or so people that were right on the other side of the border in Texas wanting to come in and them using horses and things to keep these individuals out. Um, so, so my question is, is there a race factor uh, that is involved that you see that taking place? Are Ukrainians being treated differently than countries uh, of people of color? And I say that because I'm talking about the bank, the people from India and other countries as well. Are they being treated different, Chandler? I see you shaking your head. I'm interested in what you got to say. I think so, and I'm I'm gonna add, I'm gonna put this out there because I've been exposed to it a little bit. Like people in the news and media industry have, have said things about this, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask uh, Mark and Kareem here. Have you guys seen how they report on this one? Because uh, somebody actually put a, put together a compilation of every time a news reporter says something along the lines of things like this don't happen in European countries. <laughs> things like this, this is this is not a third world nation. Things like this do not happen in countries like this. How could this happen in a nation as prosperous as Ukraine and all that that sort of thing? And it, it's created. It's like it's there's a clear bias about. Well, it's normal when this happens in the Middle East. But, yeah. but well, I think it is. I mean, the, the reality is, is the Middle East is been they have been at war ever. For nonstop for decades, you know, and much of Africa has been on civil war for decades. And so it is, I mean, and I think this is a bit of a, an unusual case, at least in recent history, although obviously Russia took over Crimea and the world did nothing uh, 2014 in, in 2014 or whenever it was. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's a super fair question. I, I, you know, and again, I'm, I tend to be a little bit of a devil's advocate at times because I like to debate. Um, <laughs> but again, I, I almost wonder if it comes back to socioeconomic things. So, you know, someone that's kind of been stranded in Haiti, Haiti is one of the poorest countries in the world and probably highly uneducated and, you know, and versus, you know, this is the entire country of the Ukraine, which is, probably a second world country, and they're fleeing to what is in essence a brother country. So Polish people, Ukrainian people, kind of the thing we talked about a little bit, it's much easier to say, I'm going to take care of my own versus someone who's a totally different culture. And, you know, Middle Eastern culture is fundamentally different than Western culture. Uh, and so it's much easier to accept someone from a similar culture than someone from just a vastly different culture. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Chandler. To that end, I would also say, but th th it's a it's another one of those like historically like the world has put these the like like if you say like oh that's normal for Africa African nations and 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 Middle Eastern nations, but it's like if you think about like let's go back to Afghanistan and you look at like just the recent century history of Afghanistan and those poor people. <laughs> have had like their entire yep. their entire world torn apart like six times over by like wh what was it i i can't quite remember like the first one but it was like the british came in and they thought they were going to take over this region and when they couldn't take it over they turned it into six different regions one of them being afghanistan and it was cut off from everything so <laughs> it wasn't a great place to live in the first place and then you know, uh, the Russians come in and uh, they start trying to take over land in there and they're not they're not being real cool about it either. And then the United States comes in and says, hey, we're going to try to fix things up. And it's just that whole area has been screwed over by. I, and I hate to be so blunt about it, white people. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I was talking uh, with my mom and she brought up the fact that Dr. Phil was. He had said something that one of the women from Ukraine really got ticked off. Uh, and, and he brought up this point, actually, Mark. And he was just saying that they're treating Ukraine in a way that they haven't treated other refugees, you know, especially those who are part of the southern hemisphere. So the darker yep. skinned individuals. And he said, you know, it's completely different 
because even the U.S. I was watching and even the United States was like, listen, we've got to do more and bring, you know, speed up the, the process to bring those Ukrainians here and to give them citizenship. And and I just think of the difference on, you know, I, I remember those cities and what they did uh, with the, 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 the individuals that were from Haiti was they literally put them back on planes or whatever it was and shipped them right back to the place of devastation. And and so there is a difference, I think, that exists in the treatment. And Mark, you said something that I think was really was really powerful. And I think it's kind of ties into what we're talking about today, because we would make this an economic conversation. And I think that many places would want to make this a economic conversation and not a racial conversation, because if it's racial conversation, then we have to, you know, get nervous about what we're saying. But if it's an even economic conversation, and it's a place where, you know, we talked about their level of intelligence or them being smart. That's exactly what, you know, uh, one of the articles I think I sent over to you, Mark, was talking about. This guy was saying, hey, this is not Haiti. This is not uh, South America. This is these are Europeaners. They're they're Ukrainians. They are smart. They're intelligent. Well, they're, I think they're educated. They're I, I educated. Yeah. That, that, you know, just because someone's not educated, they're not smart, but they're educated. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. These are educated people, and and right. I just thought to myself, in 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 terms of a humanitarian crisis, does that really play a factor in how much we help a country? Yep. Yep. And so, but so, so I was just wondering, I thought that was interesting. I thought yep. it was an interesting point to have a conversation on. And as we talk about this and we move forward, I think it's going to be interesting uh, to consider that conversation. And I just want to bring up really quickly. Just uh, one more thought to, on that one. Go ahead, Mark. A couple go ahead. Things. I think, you know, I think one of the questions that's been running around in my mind about that is, is, is it the fact that, you know, you've got Russia, which is kind of a historic nemesis has attacked this country play a role in it. I think the other thing that's kind of interesting to me maybe is, you know, their president Zelensky has been such a charismatic leader that's created so much, frankly, global support for Ukraine. Has that played a role in kind of people taking a different position with these kind of with these refugees? So just thoughts. So no, I, I think I think that he is uh, he is being supported in a way that we've never seen another nation really be supported. Well, I mean, we're experiencing something. It's happened before in, in history, but to this degree, I think in the modern world, we should say in today's world, uh, to be able to see a nation just run right over the borders and start to to take over another nation is something that is just it, it's something it's like the history book is being. This is you know, like World War, like Germany in World War Two all over. I mean, literally just rolling in, you know, and, and to, you know, again, he's he's been a real example of a leader in the sense that he's not backed down. He hasn't fled. He's rallied the people. He's rallied international support. So. Absolutely. So it's, it's quite interesting. So yeah. I want to, go ahead, Chandler. Were you going to say something? All right. You're giving me he's giving me my time. He's throwing it. I'm like, Nobody says it, so I can't get this. Just say it. No. <laughs> But but I do want to say this. I want to throw this one up. The last thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of what's hot off the press, even though it's a little not hot off the press, it may be it's not getting stale yet, but it's not so hot steaming, uh, is that I wanted to bring up just, you know, we have been talking. And as we get into today's conversation, I would love for our listeners to understand that today's conversation is going to be a continuation uh, from last week as we were talking about critical race theory. And last week, um, the week before last is actually three weeks now. We started. We talked about steps to overcoming racism, and so one of the things. And Mark, you 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 said this to me. You know, hey Kareem, how can we begin to uh, challenge people to have these conversations? And what can we do instead of just talking about race? How can we challenge people to really begin to lean in to do something and to change it? And and I I think that we all agree that having these conversations and creating a space where we can have honest conversations and dialogue about race is the beginning. So I want to give you the steps that we had uh, we shared before on overcoming race. That first one was, you know, confronting your own sins with racism, your own issues, expanding your knowledge of history was two, expanding your knowledge in the context of history, which is very important. We talked about listening and learning from people of different ethnicities. Um, we talked about resisting the urge to dismiss racial reconciliation as political issues, which often happens. Um, F was resist the urge to also dismiss systemic problems in poor and in favor of poor choices. And we'll talk about that a little bit in our discussions today. And then last one was to join or start a conversation about racial conciliation or reconciliation, whichever word you choose. And I brought up the fact that there's a group that has been listening to us have these conversations, Mark, uh, the Mary Wives Club under the direction of Carol Yoon's. And a Eunice, I think it is. And so the Mary Wives Club 
Uh, they meet every third, I think Tuesday it is. And uh, so they have asked that we come in and we have a conversation with them about critical race theory, about systemic racism, the injustices of African-Americans in this country on May 17th at 1130 a.m. It is a club that is in the city of Saginaw. This place will uh, it'll be held at the Saginaw Club uh, on May 17th at 1130 a.m. Shout out to you, Mary and the Mary uh, Carol and the Mary Wise Club for being so uh, forward thinking and having these conversations. So I'm excited for this black man to go into the Saginaw Club and have a conversation of race with these old white women. It's going to be fun. I think it'll be a great opportunity uh, to share and to, to converse. But if we can be patient and we can talk to one another and, and, and respect each other's points of view, we can have some dynamic conversations. So Mark, you've agreed to go with me during that day. We're going to, yeah. and I think it's going to be amazing. We're going to take a quick break really quick. Uh, Mark, I hope that you're, 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 you're not losing sunlight or daylight out there. So you can show us what's happening. Uh, right. in the South in the great Southwest Albuquerque, New Mexico, please position your camera so you can give us a great shot when we come back. Um, but you guys that are listening to us, please stick and stay. Don't go away. We'll be back with more United Shades of Grey. All of this rhyming is breaking my mind uh, right after this commercial break. Stay tuned. You might, it might be wiped out. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> We're seeing clouds, Mark. For those uh, of you, who... let me uh, let me see yeah. what I can do to get the issues. It's going to be whited out, I think. Well, well, I think that there is a lot of sun, but I, the the mountains are beautiful. Yeah, yeah you just it right, right about. Uh, Hold on, let yep. me sit down. Here we go. Whoa! Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So, what is the temperature like about out there, uh, Mark? Uh, it was a high of seventy today. Wow! Nice day. I could try to find something. Do you want me to sit out here for this segment or what? I mean, it's, it's completely up to you. I don't want you to get I'll have to find rattlesnakes. Something. Raise this thing. Hold on. We don't want to catch a rattle bite on TV, uh, you know, on live stream. <laughs> <laughs> the stream would get shut down so fast. <laughs> Who do we call? Who do we call in that situation? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to call his wife Mary. Like, Mary, Mark's out there on the balcony. Uh, <laughs> he's probably in a paralytic, uh, a paralytic shock right now after being bit by a rattler on, on a... <laughs> yeah, so we're going to get going. Yeah, Mark, that's... It, it, you look Ooh. like you're in the Great Savannah. He looks very high mysterious. plains desert, basically. <laughs> What'd you say? It's the high plains desert out here. Yeah, yeah. All right. So whenever you get ready, Chandler, we can uh, knock that out and get ready to this conversation. All right, we'll be coming back in just a moment. You're listening to United Shades of Grey on WSGW. Good evening, everybody. This is Kareem. We're back with United Shades of Grey, Conversations of Race in America. Well, as you guys all know, this is Women's History Month. And just during like Black History Month, we celebrated uh, Blacks who had created or done great things in the history of our country. Uh, today is our spotlight. Uh, we're continuing at Spotlight on Women during Women's History Month, celebrating those women and leaning in for them. Last week we did uh, Judge Ruth Ginsburg, right? Yeah, and today we're going to do uh, Maya Angelou. Uh, Maya Angelou born Marguerite Annie Johnson, April 4th, 1928, uh, through May 2014 when she passed away, uh, was an American poet, uh, memorist, and civil rights activist. She published seven autobiographies, three books of essays, several books of poetry, and is accredited with a list of plays, movies, television shows spanning over 50 years. Uh, might I add, she is one of my greatest, uh, one of my greatest and my my greatest uh, poet, poets, 
of all time. She received dozens of awards and more than 50 honorary degrees. Angelou is best known for a series of seven biographies which focus on her childhood and early adult experiences. The first, I Know Why the Cage Birds Sing, released in 1969, tells of her life of the up to age 17 and brought her international recognition and acclaim. She became a poet and writer after a string of odd jobs during her young adulthood. We get a little spicy here on USG. Uh, these included fry cook, sex worker, nightclub, performer, Porgy and Best cast member, Southern Christian Leadership Conference coordinator, uh, among other things. Uh, in 1982, she was named the first uh, Reynolds Professor of American Studies at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. She was an active in civil rights movement and worked with Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. Beginning in the 1990s, she made approximately eight appearances a year on the lecture circuit, something she continued in her 80s. In 1993, Angelou recited her poem on the pulse of the morning, 1993, at the first inauguration of Bill Clinton, making her the first poet to make an inauguration recitation since Robert Frost at the inauguration of John F. Kennedy in 1961. Uh, for those of you who are out there, she is one of my favorite, as I said. Uh, she a uh, phenomenal woman. Uh, I know why the cage bird stings. And then there's this one. And still I rise. I want to read an excerpt. You may write me down in history with your bitter, tattered, lie, twisted lies. You may trod me in the dirt, very dirt, but still like dust I rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you so beset with gloom? Because I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides. Just like hope springing high, still I'll rise. This is a wonderful poem. It goes on in its length. Look that one up. That's a good one and a keeper for the future. All right. We're going to continue in our conversation uh, today. We're talking about CRT, critical race theory. And just to give you a quick definition of what that is, uh, minding you that uh, we do have our lines open. If someone would like to call in and be a part of this conversation or even ask a question, you can call in at 989-776-776. 6517. We'll have to continually uh, publicize that number because we haven't been doing so. So people know that they can get involved with this conversation. But what is CRT? Uh, it's a way of understanding how American racism has shaped uh, public policy. OK. Um, and so what we're saying, in essence, and I'll give you the abbreviated version. Um, uh, it is when we have had 270 years of slavery uh, that took place here in the United States. Uh, followed by, you know, this whole thing of reparation after the our world war or our civil war here. Um, and then when that took place, we had another hundred years of Jim Crow laws uh, that were limiting the rights of these newfound freedoms that these slaves were having. 18, I think it was about 1870. Uh, black men were given the right to vote. All men were given the right to vote uh, along that period of time. Then it included a series of laws that disenfranchised. Uh, voters from that period of time. And so that process of time leading up to the 60s uh, of change uh, in that time, there were our, our racial prejudices or things that existed uh, went from just an emotion, a feeling and things that we were doing outwardly uh, into our laws and our systems of governance. Uh, we then see a change with the 1960s, the civil rights movement. They came in, they wanted to have, you know, hey, we need to fight for change and rights and equality and all those things led by MLK, uh, Martin Luther, Malcolm X, all of these other, Abernathy, all of these great leaders, Jesse Jackson. Um, and then coming into the 70s, we see uh, the the um, Fourth Amendment uh, really being brought into the, the, the idea, the concept, the concept of racial prejudice and the fact that we could no longer use race as a way to uh, really just kind of, you know, judge or do things or discriminate against people. Uh, and in many ways, individuals who believe in CRT would say that that particular situation then took it to where race had to be or discrimination, racial discrimination had to be defined totally on the color of your skin, even though there were systems and laws that were in place, some which had never been repelled since the Jim Crow laws fully uh, brought into uh, into mainstream uh, these laws that now. Uh, are a part of our systems of government that continue to allow 
uh, racial discrimination uh, to take place in a legal form. So there you got it. Uh, the long and short of it all. And on last week, um, you know, we were talking about a number of things. We talked about how the Virginia governor brought up the idea of CRT and he won his gubernatorial ship. Uh, and and uh, because people were afraid of this and we were asking ourselves, why are people afraid? Uh, have you guys had any opportunity really to think about this? And why are people so afraid of having conversations of CRC, CRT and not only just having these conversations, but allowing their kids to even be in places where critical race theory uh, is a part of this uh, conversation or framework? Yeah, you know, you know, I think it's a lot what we said last week, ultimately, which is, again, race is a race is a touchy subject. And for a white person to have a conversation about race, there's not a lot of upside and a lot of downside to have it. Um, so that's why I think, generally speaking, people don't like to have that kind of discussion or it's a very sensitive topic. Again, I think critical race theory, again, there's a lot of, uh, I don't, I haven't gone back and read the original papers on critical race theory, but there's a lot of different, you know, and the one again, I'm, I've pulled up again, I'm looking in front of me that critical race scholars argue that ideas of race, basically it's not biological in nature, it's social. And it right. specifically states here that the interests of white people, you know, it's laws and systems are created for the benefit of white people at the expense of people of color. And, you know, and again, I, I don't, I've gone back and I've read um, the Fourth Amendment. You know, it's got nothing to do with color. It's basically you can't search without proper cause. Now, how it's being possibly implemented, you know, that's a different story. And so I think people generally kind of wince at the idea that somehow the Constitution and our laws, at least as of today, are racist in nature in and of themselves. And I think that's how people view that, you know, that's how it's being proposed or positioned. And, and again, I think CRT, back to like why people don't want um, their kids exposed to it potentially. Again, it's a lot of what we just talked about it. It's a theory, it's a concept, it's not a proven fact. And it kind of, again, it potentially attacks the kind of the foundation, the constitution, the foundations of this country as being negative. And so that's why they, I, and I, I frankly don't know, again, just being really transparent, if I had a grade school kid, I'd want that. I just don't want any kind of theory or concept taught to my kid, especially at that age. Now, high school and college, sure, why not? But at an early age, I'd rather have my kids being taught the fundamentals of things, the facts, not different concepts or theories. Okay, great, great point, but Mark. Go ahead. That's that's the odd thing about this whole thing is CRT is a college level course. It's not necessarily being taught to children. I well, don't. But if you look yeah. at where they, they're, you know, like the governor of Virginia is basically saying we're it's not going to be taught into our grade schools and high school students. I, again, I don't know what was going on in Virginia, but potentially people were wanting to teach it there. I'm assuming we're talking about teaching it there. Well, I don't think that that was ever the, the initial plan. And, and I yeah. think that's what you're getting to, Tyler. I think that was a part of the the, the fear basing or the fear right. monitoring that they were doing. But but let's 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 even take that into consideration, because when I grew up, you know, um, there are a lot of things that were inconsistent in terms of how I how how things were when I was raised. Um, fortunately, I had, you know, a group of friends that, you know, we, race was not so highly an issue all of the time, really in my in my immediate friend group. But um, outside of that friend group, uh, when we were riding bikes and going down the street and 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 doing things in the community, uh, it, it certainly came up and issues arose that were, I think, racially charged. I know for a fact um, uh, my mom was nearly she was pregnant with my brother, um, nearly pulled out of a car. Uh, and this was probably 1989, 1990, uh, you know, at a basketball game at one of my basketball games. Uh, because, you know, out in Millington, and Millington is like a million miles away. It's on the other side of Frankenmuth. Um, and it was racially charged. It was like a scene from the 60s. Yeah. So we know that those ideologies and those thought processes, uh, they still exist. Mm -hmm. and so the idea is that you can kill, you know, you, you really can't kill a thought or a concept or an idea. Or an idea. Um, and so you can change a law. But if the same people who had those ideologies are in control of the type of legislation that is created, then those law inherently have those same biases or those um, 
racist tendencies that are that are linked into the law. And we talked about giving some ideas and examples. But Chandler, I see that you are there's something you want to say. I know that you say that I want to talk about some specific ideas as you guys have kind of challenged on last week for us to share. But go ahead, Chandler. Oh, no, no, I, I, I was I, I agree with pretty much everything you're saying. And I know Mark's got some very good points. OK, so so one of the things and we were talking about specific examples and, and I told you guys I would think about it and some knocked on my door. Um, I, I you guys know that I am a pastor, I'm a pastor in a uh, it's the north side of the city of Saginaw. It's a underserved community. It is a, a lower economic area community. I never thought that I would be back in Saginaw, but I'm like, I'm not even from the north side, but I'm pastoring on the north side. And I love that community. Um, during the pandemic, and I'll just give you an, an example of what I mean. During the pandemic uh, in 2020, uh, March, uh, school was shut down. Uh, so kids were out of school. Um, and so many kids uh, from, from communities uh, of, of, of lower income communities, when they go to school, that's usually where they get the, the bulk of their nutrition. And so because I knew that those kids were not in school, I partnered with, you know, a healthy nutrition, uh, something from the YM nutrition, something vision nutrition or whatever it was that the YMCA was doing and our church. And we started feeding kids every single day. And we were literally giving out, you know, hundreds of meals, sandwiches, fruit and, you know, just uh, the whole thing, uh, making sure that they were able to get their nutrition. Now, I thought about this. Um, and so this is an underserved community. There's not a lot of people that live there. As a matter of fact, um, our current designation uh, up until a week ago was this. It was a green zone. Um, we talked, Mark, about how in communities of color, and, and I think you brought this up, Chandler, how they will often, you know, use uh, public transportation. They'll build highways through communities of color, things that impact those communities, railways, tra subways. And it's something that has continually happened over and over and over again. Well, this particular side of town has been separated by I-675. Uh, it was an area that has long and traditionally been a community of, uh, you know, black community. 675 now separates this community. And everything north of 75 has been called a green zone, which means that they're going to let it return back to, you know, its old green, you know, Swedes, greens, whatever, the natural habitat. Um, so our church began picking up a number of properties over there. There's, there's uh, a very dense, a sparsely populated area, but there's people who live there. General Motors is on one side. Rifkin is on the other side. And they made a push to make this area a light industrial area on the same side where these residences are now before they were separated by what M13. And so another example of how I think uh, we talk about systemic racism and how, how racism and these policies of inequity continue to exist. Are, are, this is a perfect example. Um, we don't see uh, uh, communities, residential communities in predominantly white communities being turned into light industrial places. They got a plant that's been inoperable halfway. You know, they're they're still operating at General Motors on there. Then there is a, a a Rifkin dump or I don't know what they do at Rifkin, but I know it has a lot to do with metals and end products. And now they're coming across the street into the neighborhood saying that. Oh, they're going to put a fence up and some type of barrier uh, between the residents and and these light industrial places. But nobody wants a machine operating business right next to their home uh, because it devalues that property. And so that is an example of what I meant on how these policies come into play. And, Mark, you use the term, uh, you know, economic issues. Um, but these are economic issues. Yes. But those same people that are usually on the lower end of that economic pole happen to be people of color in most yeah, states. Yeah, that's what I think. When you use the term racism, people, it implies that this was done on purpose specifically to damage the black community. And I, I just don't, and maybe I'm naive, believe that's what's going on here. I believe what's going on here is is like, okay, Saginaw's a financially strapped community. They'd like to get a higher tax base. To get a higher tax base, you need businesses. The logical place to put businesses are in an area where you have a partially used plant and it's got low real estate value. And now it happens to be adjacent neighborhoods tend to be lower income neighborhoods, which tend to be a higher percentage of black families. 
that I don't believe, I, again, naively don't believe that that's racially motivated because I think you could go to other cities which have poor white neighborhoods and the same thing has been done to them. Um, and, 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 and Mark, if you would look at that consistently, if we would look at that and we take, you know, this is, these are things when we talk about how the housing industry and red lighting these districts and bringing public transportation, historically, we can look across the board from, you know, Harlem, New York to Los Angeles, California. And it's, it's still those same communities of color, um, that, that tend to do that. And, and, and when we look at those places, we have to ask ourselves, how did these areas become low income areas to begin with? Um, how did the property values deflate in such a way uh, that they have lost their value? Um, well, if you have a community of strong home ownership and people are owning homes and taking care of manicured lawns and those things, and then they bring a train station or a railroad through that community, instantly the value of those homes go down. And that is typically what's happening. I know that happens over there. And, and, and in these communities, it's crazy. Four o'clock in the afternoon, you know, there are railroad trains. There's trains that are going through the railroad. I've never right. seen this, you know, and on the west side of town. I live on the west side of town. I have, you know, property on the east side of town. I lived on the east side of town for a long time. And I've never seen this happen on the west side. I don't get stopped by trains on my way home on the west side of town, except for areas where they built communities, higher end communities in those subdivisions and created subdivisions in those areas. So those are just examples of how where it becomes difficult, Mark. And I think that people say that, you know, they, they don't want to say that this is racist. They say that this is, you know, it's, it's, it's economical. This is because it's low income, but those I issues in those areas tend to be both people of color and low income. It tends to be consistent. Another example that I would like us to just kind of have a little conversation about um, would be the issue of, uh, during 2020, we saw a huge uh, influx and, and the things that took place with COVID in communities of color. Um, and we looked at how uh, it impacted communities of color. And what I saw was great disparities within the healthcare system and access to fair and equitable health care. Um, that is another example, I think, in which uh, we have you know made health care affordable for folks who are rich, which are moderately well off. And it becomes an issue once again, uh, 29, you know, we, we have, we are 39% people of color, 39% of the nation uh, now. And when I say people of color, I'm talking about all people of color, not just blacks, but about 39% uh, of the nation is now a person of color. Yet that same group of people are, are the poorest and have the worst health care. Why are our systems this way? Where does this come from? Does it just, you know, happen overnight or are there re reasons for this type of um, continual poverty in that same group? And that would be my question. Where do you think this happens or comes from? Well, I, I'm always going to go back to kind of my thing again, which is I, I get the concern about healthcare in this country. Now, I've lived in Europe as well, and I've been all over the world. On one hand, the U.S. has the best healthcare system in the world. There's a reason people who have money fly to the US to get healthcare. And if you, for the average person, our healthcare system for all of its faults is actually pretty good having lived other places. Now, if you don't have money, that's that's again, you know, so, so if you work for a company that has a health insurance and you have access to healthcare, it's a pretty good system, frankly. Now, if you don't have money that and don't aren't employed, now you that's where you, the issue arises and um again that come, in, in a sense comes back to me as a social economic issue and you know to me the big question is is okay how do we how do we change this it's how do we take those communities and give them better opportunities to have a better economic position and you know that's ultimately how you fix some of these things let's let's look at it from a social economic standpoint um uh, we'll look at you know the fdr and his you know the welfare system and what's yep. going on these systems really i mean i think these are examples of policies uh that were self-perpetuating and 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 would continue uh to keep people in the position that they were in life and yep. we look at you know we have systems that encourage people to have children uh, and, and have the more children you have, and if your husband isn't in the home, then we pay you more. 
Yeah. And so I mean, it, for all their probably good intentions, they probably had the opposite effect oftentimes. Absolutely. So when we look at these systems and we look at how these are once again systems that are in our in our uh, in our government that are continually perpetuate uh, that that one particular part of our country uh, tend to, people of color tend to stay on that bottom uh, quadrant of of our wealth systems and and when we look at all of the other systems we look at how they are then you know political the disenfranchisement from politics. Sure, we have the right to vote, but the moment that, that that blacks were given the right to vote, then they have all of these other things uh, that were put into place in terms of the identification checks. The you know, first it was you didn't have a job. If you didn't have a job, then you put in jail. I mean, but we see the perpetuation of these types of uh, laws that continually disenfranchise people after access to them have been given, and even today we're we're an entire. Senate and Republican House, uh, uh, not Republican House, but Senate and a House cannot come to terms on making sure that blacks votes and people of color, their votes are are counted and are fair and are safe. And they're using this concept that, you know, race is being stolen, but there's absolutely no proof of these types of things to further disenfranchise people. I had a white man say something to me one time ago, this this old white man. He says, I will allow black men to be famous. They'll be actors and athletes to make millions of dollars but they'll never be the politicians that make the laws that govern me. And when he said that to me, it, it, it I was kind of like, wow, why would he say that? But then I thought about it because the legal system is the way that we keep a nation or a people in their place. And we have seen laws be put in place. Uh, you know, New York with uh, <laughs> Mayor Bloomberg, uh, his stop and frisk policy, which this new guy that's out there is saying, hey, we might bring that back. You know, and and it's really about, you know, we talk about, you know, why why is it a problem? But why are blacks coming into contact with police officers on such a on a regular occurring basis becomes the issue? You know, it's not just what happens. Why would you catch it? Yeah. My question would be, is it the law itself or how it's being implemented by an organization or by a group of people? And. Yeah. Anyway, so it sounds like we're going into break. Yeah. No, no, I think I think it's both of those, though, Mark. Yeah. Um, it's the law. I don't think the law itself is racist. The, it, the law in and of itself is not racist. Race is not mentioned in the law. That's exactly what I'm saying. So that is exactly how I'm saying that we no longer use race as the, the code word. So we eliminate the idea of the color of skin. That That's a no, no. But then we implement it in a way and in communities where black and brown folks are most often prevalent. And so you're absolutely right. So the law itself is whitewashed, but the activities that take place and how that law effectuates and is promulgated in our communities is then racist in how it carries out. So I agree with you 1000 percent. Mark, I am so jealous of you out there <laughs> basking in the sun. When are you coming back this way? Saturday. Saturday. I'll be back in Saturday. Well, we're, 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 we're ordering up snow for Sunday morning to give you a piece of what we're no, I'm just joking. <laughs> we want to thank you, Mark, for tuning in and Chandler, you for being here. And those of you who have tuned into this conversation, like tag and share this thing. We're going to continue on. An hour goes by so fast, but we want you to come. We certainly believe in a time where we are not red states or blue states, but we are the United Shades of Gray. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next week. So I take it we got no callers. Are we off? Uh, we're on the stream. All right, so we're out there, Mark. Mark, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Like, are we off? <laughs> He's like, we're in the stream. We're still in the stream. <laughs> Before it's going, Mark. So, so what are your plans while you, while you're out there? You're going to be out there till Saturday. What are you going to be doing? Yeah, Saturday. To Saturday. We're again we're with my oldest and his family. We're just kind of hanging with them on spring break. So we went up to Santa Fe yesterday. Went to the Albuquerque Zoo today, and just doing different things around the area. So, how old is that kid that you 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 are out there visiting, Mark? I'm I'm curious. I'm gonna There's ask two. You. There's a two and a half and a seven and a half. Not the grandkids. That you're, yes. Oh. I, but he's my oldest. He's 36, going on 37. I was going to say, if you got a two and a half, buddy, I'm praying for you. No, I, 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 <laughs> those dudes my age that get divorced, marry a young woman, and have another family, they're crazy. So. <laughs> okay, so he's this kid is 37, you said? 
36 going on 37. He's a major in the Army. All right. So so his perspective will be very different. Some of the questions that we talked about today and, and, and race, because I think that this younger generation's viewpoints on race are so different. Oh, they're um, way different. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and, and race and, and what I love is that I don't see race playing a as a predominant feature in how they build their relationships. But but some of the questions we talked about today and you just just ask yourself, you know, what is his thoughts about? Uh, some of the things we talked about, it'd be interesting to get a report of how he feels about some of those things. Okay. Compared to some of us washed up old guys like you and yeah. Chance. <laughs> I mean, you know, white people are always going to kind of blanch at the racist part because it, you know, the, in their mind, when you say like the system is racist, it's kind of like we're all conspiring against the black man. And I just don't be, believe that to be true. So. But I don't I don't believe that to true. I think that yeah. overall there is a fear of what black people uh, can do. I don't think that everyone feels that way. Um, and, and when I say that, I would use places that, we, you know, where blacks have been predominantly very successful in doing what they've done. Those places have end up usually destroyed by people because of their fear, their hatred of what they've been able to accomplish. Yeah. Now, I will say that. Um, but I don't think that the world uh, civil rights movement would not have been as effective as it was uh, had it not been for white allies. And so um, I believe that there is still a sector of, of, of the country that still wants to make America great again. Uh, well, for sure. There's always going to be that. I think. And Mark, really quickly, and this is kind of like an afterglow show. And I want to ask you this question. What is that slogan? What does that slogan mean to you? Chandler, Mark, what does that slogan mean to you? Ooh. Which slogan? Make America great again. Makes I mean I just associate that with Trump, who I can't, and I'm a lifelong Republican, can't stand. I, mean, I, I, I know that. I know that. Yeah, so. But when you heard that, Chandler, what what did that mean to you? I, everyone, I think, associates it with Trump now, but in terms of what that slogan means to you, well, on its surface, and and not like associated with anything, in in a way like that, always struck me as like. Uh, it just sounds like something that's like return to the 1950s or something like that in a generic way. Like they can't, or they don't like all the technology, like a certain group of people doesn't like the technology and the way things are done with the race and the politics and all that stuff. And then you brought up something a few weeks ago that really struck me in a way and made me actually come at it from a different perspective in that um, when a lot of uh not just uh, black people in this country, but a lot of people of color, uh, received their rights written you know written into law in amendments that struck me as well where there's I, I thought about it there's a significant population in this country who lived were very cognizant too during the time of segregation and i i'd like something in me clicked where i'm like i'm not totally convinced that those people who are alive and were against desegregation don't think it's still a flash in the pan yeah, where that can be that can be changed. Like all of these laws can be changed tomorrow. And like you said, it's like, yeah, it's an amendment it had to be written in and it can be taken out just as easily. Yeah. So it like like it led me down this rabbit hole of thoughts where I'm like, mm, I, I have. A lot I, yeah, I didn't take anything like that. that. I, I just never go there, frankly. I, <laughs> you know, so, Mark, it's because you want to be you want to see the world as you, you want a United States, the gray world. I, uh, do. I, I just think it is more like. You know, back to the Reagan, you know, again, he was a Republican, he tended to be conservative, back to strong, small government, big, you know, better economy, lower taxation. That's kind of how I kind of took it. He's the furthest thing from Reagan. He's a toxic narcissist, you know, uh, that'll probably generate some calls. But. That could be Trump's perspective on it, but I yeah. like from his followers' perspective, a lot of like the people I would know. Yeah. So so for me, um, when I heard that, you know, first heard that slogan, you know, make America great again, you know, and, and it sounds crazy. And people get upset about this when I say this all the time. And I'm like, at what you know century or what time in American history was America great? Because I don't think that we've ever shown how great we can be. I think we've had glimpses of greatness when the World Trade Center happened, you know, the, the bombing 9-11. Yeah. Uh, we race and those we were American. And at that time, we all bled, you know, Six moments of crisis for people there to put go. all their differences aside. It's, yeah. It's human, frankly, it's human nature. Basically. Yeah. You yeah. Exactly. All that other stuff. Exactly. Know? But during the other parts of time, I'm thinking like, you know, we were either slaves or we were, uh, you know, being incarcerated unfairly or 
we were fighting for rights that, that you know, that we're still fight, some of those we're still fighting yeah. for. And so to me, it was a, a it spoke to a place in time that I could not relate to. Um, I believe that America is a great country uh, with great opportunities. But I think that we also have some great issues that we have to be able to overcome. And honestly, you know, Mark, it's, it's interesting. We've said this a million times that, you know, white America doesn't want to have conversations on race. And I think that their fear is uh, that they, they're they going to be called racist. But the idea is, does it make a difference if we call you a racist when you are acting racist? Or, you know, are you OK with not being called a racist as long as you can continue racist policies? And that becomes the issue. And I think that's why we have to have conversations, because I think some things happen um, that people just think, you know, well, I didn't really see it that way. But if we can have a conversation, we can show you why this is intrinsically, you know, and brings inequities into the situation. Then I think then that's what we need to have happen. But it requires for us to take a look at things and mm -hmm. recognize, um, as you said, the advantage that has been given. And that's what we were talking about in the conversation. When I ask, you know, why are people of color? Why do black people have a tendency to be in the most impoverished areas of the world? Well, it's because when you start off with nothing. Um, uh, it means brings our dumb. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to see what Mark is saying. There's someone here before I finish my point. Michael Sanchez says it means bring, I agree with this, Michael, that other countries got all of our manufacturing jobs and people. I that think that's, uh, I the agree. Minute it says Mark, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and people that was proud to live in the United States. Now it's a bunch of people. Are, are such snowflakes. <laughs> I won't go there, but uh, I do think manufacturing is what built this country. And it's a little bit like you talked about, like worrying about gas price. Ultimately, yep. what has happened here is we have moved a big chunk of our manufacturing jobs, which is a great way for people to get out to improve their financial position. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we've, we've that's a solid job. sold those to places like China, Taiwan, Vietnam, Malay, people where people are getting pennies on an hour so that we can all have, you know, so we can all get things way cheaper and have disposable shit. Sorry for using that language. Good thing we're now, not recording anymore. <laughs> and at some point, I do think the, the U.S. population, the U.S. average U.S. citizen has been spoiled by us moving our jobs to places where they don't care about the environment, they don't care about the people they you know how they treat the people they employ also we can buy something 10 cents cheaper and at some point we've got to suck it up and be willing to pay more and move manufacturing back to this country well uh, as speaking as somebody who uh uh doesn't get it paid a lot as it is i need to be paid more so i can pay for the the american Understood. Understood. <laughs> hey, I know right, right. everything's coming from Taiwan right now. No, yeah. um, but uh, hey, you can get it from the dollar store. That's where, where you can get it. <laughs> but, you know, Mark, uh, you know, and I think this is interesting. We didn't talk about it today. And Michael Chan Sanchez, thank you for your comments. I think that was a great comment. Um, I, I was looking at um, even environmental justice and we look at how uh, that takes place in our country. And I look at what happened with the Flint water crisis. Um, and the fact that the government knew what was going on, people knew that this was taking place. So it was, you know, do we do something? Um, do we do something about this and 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 protect these people who are vulnerable to this lead poisoning that's going to take place? No, because it costs too much. And so when we looked at who was there and who was benefiting and who was being hit by this, it was minorities. And so once again, we can continue over and over and over again, say, oh, it's social economic. Well, you know what? Social economic and impoverished communities and communities of color tend to be that same 29, 12, 13. I, I would agree. Yeah, I 100 percent understand and agree. I mean, to me, I'm about kind of like, well, how do we how do we get out of this? Uh, you know, I fully acknowledge that, you know, that populations of color are on average at a dis economic disadvantage and have you know have lots of walls that they have to climb and to me it's about okay how do we change that going forward and it's about how do we give them access to you know better education and i i'm not a, i'm not a big believer you've already talked about it that big government is necessarily a solution because ultimately you know we've tried that and it's created systems and i again i don't think social security and welfare it was 
again, I don't believe in conspiracies that somehow those were created to keep the black man down. I just don't believe that. So it, it just happens to happen that way. And I guess it's just once again associated now economics. <laughs> but uh, Elaine Cook, we see your, your she says because banks prefer to give minorities a loan for a vehicle over a uh, loan to own property. I mean, you talk about you talk about banking, you talk about loans. There's been historically, and, and so this is the thing that, that that I think people don't want to understand, and it comes down to this question. In this world, I do a lot of conversations about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And oftentimes, and Mark, I, I said this, you know this, when we first met, Mark, this yep. is how our conversation started. And, and you were like, hey, I really want to bring some changes and I want to bring some, you know, some diversity. And I think that it's just the right thing to do. And my question to you was, why do you want it? And then the second thing was, what are you willing to give up? And, and that's a tough question to be asked. Because the reality of it is there is because, you know, for 250 years, I was, you know, my family was owned. My, my forefathers were owned by white yeah. Americans. And yeah. then for another hundred years, uh, we were continually um, enslaved by the, um, the the laws that were put into place. And then you got another hundred years where we were fighting for equality. Um, you know, so that is a very long head start. And so when you talk about someone's got to be placed on the poverty line and someone else gets a benefit, there's a reason why we're talking about those, you know, when we talk about economics and we talk about people of color and and and, and all of that other stuff, they tend to be the same groups yeah. you know, because of those head starts. Yeah. So you said something, Mark, how do we begin to make change? And I think that it means that there has to be uh, some 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 serious things that take place. How can my family, you know, be enslaved to keep Georgetown open, but none of us have have the opportunity to go to Georgetown? Sure. So that becomes a question that we have to ask, um, and and we've got to be we've got to understand that if we really understand what this means, it means that there has to be, um, and I use that term that you love so much. There has to be a system of uh, reparations. And, and when I talk about reparations and in, in my understanding and, and in my personal view, it talks about repair, repair. There's gotta be a system of reparations that is put in place um, that looks at what we talk about is one of the biggest issues, the wealth gap. Um, and it also has to address education. The fact that many of our America's systems and institutions were built by slaves, but not used by slaves. So they need to be, when it comes to, we should not have to take out a lot of loans to go to school to get educated because education is one of the greatest ways to overcome that system. I'm not saying give out checks to everybody, but I'm saying make access equitable uh, in, in the nation. And I think that we got to start with that conversation and it's a rough conversation, uh, but it's one that I definitely think that we need to have. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, again, we've talked, I saw this video during the pandemic and for whatever reason, it really spoke to me and they, had all, you know, it's, people have probably seen this, all these kids lined up and they said like, ask these series of questions, like who comes from a two parent home, who has this, who has that. Then they go, you know, certain kids keep moving forward. Other kids are stuck at the line. Pretty soon somebody's halfway to the finish line and then they start the race. And of course the kids that had all these advantages won the race. And the question was, was well, like, is that kid necessarily the fastest kid? The answer is obviously no. Doesn't mean he's not fast. Doesn't mean he's not good. But and that really struck me and stuck is stuck with me. And you know, and I'm not a CEO of a company anymore, at least not for now. And um, but one of the things I was really thinking about towards the end, and I've continued to think about it since then, is is like you know when we interview people, and it's kind of built off some things you you and I have talked about, yeah. which is like you know pick hemlock or Dow, you know we have certain resumes that we're looking for. They come from certain schools, they have certain GPAs, they have these extracurriculars. And yeah, there's no, there's no kind of racial part of that. And frankly, if you're a young black engineer or a young female engineer, frankly, you're probably gonna get more opportunities, at least initially, than somebody else because people are looking for demographics. Um, but the fundamental question I've got is, is like, just because you've got this standard resume, does that actually mean you're better than someone that's kind of cobbled together an education going to like community college and the local school? And how do we interview better to look for intangibles? You know, like look for this person can learn on the fly anything. This person's just not gonna quit. This person's 
And, you know, and how do you search for, because there's lots of people that come from those demographics that have that. And all they need is a chance and some help along the way. And how do you, how do you develop a better system to identify those people and give them access? So I don't have any of the answers. They're all great questions. So. Well, but I'll tell you what, Mark, uh, I think the mentality and the philosophy um, that you were utilizing, and I think that you were just kind of, you know, you, you, I think you left before your time, but that's just me talking. <laughs> um, I think, I think just, uh, but even our interaction and, and, yeah. you know, me, me being very direct with you, I think that you took it in stride um, and you embraced the fact that I was willing to be honest with you in that conversation. I think that that's really important. And, and not only that, um, even the things that you didn't quite understand, you listened to those things. And I think that that was the thing that made me feel like, OK, this dude can be sincere. I can trust this guy um, and be honest with him about where I'm at because you were willing to listen. And I think you didn't blow it off as, you know, oh, you're just oh, you're you, you, you leaned into the conversation. And I think that that's where we have to begin really addressing these issues is that we have to have people who are on, you know, who are allies who are willing to listen to those conversations and engage in those conversations. And like you say, you know, if it changes the way you think about something, fine. But if you listen, at least, uh, then then a person feels heard um, and and you're going to be more conscious of that when this conversation or the situation arises again. And I've seen you take those steps before, uh, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to make sure that we had this platform to have this conversation, because I haven't seen other CEOs um, kind of maneuver in quite the same way that you have and try to be, you know, and try to make race not an issue. Right. Uh, you understand what I'm saying? Yep, I do. And things I always tell you, like, I don't want you to be colorblind. I don't want you to yeah. not see my race. I want you to see me, right. you know, see my race, see my diversity, see what I bring to the table, my differences, and allow me to bring my whole self into that space. And let's enjoy and embrace those differences. And, I, and that's what I really appreciate about you. Thank you, Kareem. And I just, I, I believe in people. I believe most people are good people. And it's easy to kind of like, if you don't know somebody, it's easy to kind of demonize them or push them aside. But I think once you get to know people, you find out that, you know, most people are pretty much good people and have the same wants and desires as you. And that's why I'm just, again, naively a believer in the more we can just get people interacting with each other, they go like, hey, that person's not that different than me when it's all said and done, really. Absolutely. So. All right. So, Mark, we're going to end this conversation. We thank you guys for tuning in. We still got people that are standing in the social media stream. Like, tag, and share this conversation. And we'll make sure that we put uh, out in advance some of the conversations and topics that we're going to talk about so that we can be, uh, begin to build this stream. Those of you who are continually coming in, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we know that people are listening to this, to this conversation because we're getting calls and thoughts after uh, when it airs on Sunday. So this is good, Mark. Thank you for your hard work, Chandler, over there uh, on the ones and twos in the place to be. No, I'm just joking. Uh, God bless you all. Take care of yourselves. Yeah. Peace.